People have always contemplated the big question, meaning of life, in the wrong way. The question itself is incorrect and needs to be reworked. If anything, reversed. Man should not ask what the meaning of life is, but rather should recognise that it is he who is asked. It is man who is questioned by life itself, not man questioning life. Therefore, it is not the question of what is the meaning of life, but rather what does life mean to me? To answer for the existence of one's own life, it is of primary necessity to see that one can only respond to such a question by being responsible. Responsibility is therefore the essence of human existence. Viktor E. Frankl was an Austrian neurologist, psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. After surviving such terrors, he wrote one of his most popular books, Man's Search for Meaning, and developed the psychological therapeutic doctrine called logotherapy, whereby logos in Greek means meaning, therefore meaning therapy. He asked the question, what drives humanity? His conclusion was this, the will to meaning. It was the desire for meaning that made people continue on living. This view would contradict other psychoanalytic viewpoints at the time. For example, Freud believed in the will to pleasure and Adler believed in the will to power. Man's search for meaning for Frankl was man's primary motivation in his life and certainly not something of a secondary rationalization of instinctual drives as Freud would call it. As I quote, there are some authors who contend that meanings and values are nothing but defense mechanisms, reaction formations and sublimations. But as for myself, I would not be willing to live merely for the sake of my defense mechanisms, nor would I be ready to die merely for the sake of my reaction formations. Man, however, is able to live and even to die for the sake of his ideals and values." End quote. From his experiences in the Holocaust, Frankl saw something empirical at its most extreme that would detonate psychological fatalism. This was all part of what Frankl called the collective neurosis, which is that of nihilism, with the belief that being itself has no meaning. Frankl saw that the fatalistic conditioning of science on mankind would only make the nihilistic neurotic believe themselves as a pawn and victim of outer and inner influences and circumstances. Thus, denying man's freedom and making the existential vacuum ever so bigger. I quote, This neurotic fatalism is fostered and strengthened by a psychological therapy which denies that man is free. End quote. What Frankl saw beyond the conceptions of determinism and scientific fatalism was that, on a foundational level, man's ability to withstand conditions is a definition of freedom. This understanding did not neglect the reality of man's deterministic nature, but saw, with insight from the Holocaust, that man is capable of defying and braving the worst conditions conceivable, even those with the sole intent to destroy. Different wills, in my view, which through mere force of being meaning, power or pleasure, push back the deterministic wall to its final end point whereby the will itself isolates determinism as of where it should be. Within this relative space of start to end or will to finality, there lies a degree of freedom which allows one to be capable or incapable of defying or acquiescing towards conditions of a brutal nature. In relation to the will, to meaning, this is of a highest degree. It is all dependent on how much one withstands to bear in the search for meaning, Thus, within the will to meaning, there is a degree of freedom. The way in which logotherapy deviates from psychoanalysis is that it considers man as a being whose main concern consists in fulfilling a meaning. Rather than in the mere gratification and satisfaction of drives and instincts, or in merely reconciling the conflicting claims of id, ego and superego, or in the mere adaption and adjustment to society and environment. What he saw in the concentration camps was that people who knew there was a task waiting for them to fulfill were most apt to survive. Hence, the Nietzschean quote, he who has a why can bear almost any how. Because of this, Frankl saw that for a good mental health, a tension needs to be of existence. That tension would most precisely be, I quote, the gap between what one is and what one should become. 
he saw that it was extremely dangerous to presuppose the need for equilibrium or a tensionless state, because what man really needs is, I quote, not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal, a freely chosen task, end quote. Something that Frankel saw as being the widespread phenomenon of the 20th century and thus causing a loss of meaning was what he called the existential vacuum. He said that it was the result of two fundamental occurrences, one, the loss of tradition, and two, loss of animal instinct. The fact that man has to make a choice puts the prospect of paradise and security at a halt. I quote, No instinct tells him what he has to do, and no tradition tells him what he ought to do. Sometimes he does not even know what he wishes to do. Instead, he either wishes to do what other people do, conformism, or he does what other people wish him to do, totalitarianism, end quote. Another quote, he says, The existential vacuum manifests itself mainly in a state of boredom. Now we can understand Schopenhauer when he said that mankind was apparently doomed to vacillate eternally between the two extremes of distress and boredom, end quote. Depression, aggression, and addiction. This is what you could call the mass neurotic triad of the people. But this is what Frankl saw as a result of the existential vacuum of the 20th century. All three of these have nothing but skyrocketed since the appearance of the existential vacuum. His attack against Alderian and Freudian psychoanalysis in relation to the will to power and will to pleasure is based on the fact that the existential vacuum can mask itself behind these different strivings of the will. I quote, There are various masks and guises under which the existential vacuum appears. Sometimes the frustrated will to meaning is vicariously compensated for by a will to power, including the most primitive form of the will to power, the will to money. In other cases, the place of frustrated will to meaning is taken by the will to pleasure. This is why existential frustration often eventuates to sexual compensation. We can observe in such cases that the sexual libido becomes rampant in the existential vacuum." End quote. We can see how Frankl's answer to the meaning of life is very similar to Camus' view of the meaning to life. Camus makes the proposition of revolt against suicide, freedom against ideology, and passion for living without hope. Camus' view of passion for life is similar to Frankl's reversal question of the meaning to life, which is that of what is your calling, what is life's calling to you. But Frankl does view that there are three fundamental objective ways in which we can find meaning in life that is through deed, love and suffering. In reference to love, this meaning can be attained just by experiencing something, whether it be goodness, beauty, truth, nature or culture, but also by experiencing another human being, whereby these qualities can be the embodiment of another individual. The meaning of love is located in the ability for another person to release the beloved's potentialities into the mind so that they can become actualized. This is the motion that unfolds when the partner sees the possibilities of the other, thus making them come true. In the process of love, a partner can give rise to the realization of their potential, which therefore gives their lives meaning. This can work in a reciprocal manner. Suffering, on the other hand, can give rise to meaning when a personal tragedy is turned into triumph. For example, the realisation and understanding of suffering gives an artist the pure groundwork to produce a beautiful tragic painting, whereby the meaning of life could be for the artist to express life in art. We can develop a meaning to suffering by simply changing the attitude and the way we look at it. For example, let's say as a husband, your wife, or vice versa, has died from an illness and you have been in despair ever since. Thus you ask the question to yourself, what if this was reversed? What if it happened to me and not her? Well, she would obviously also be in great despair and suffering, but what we can conclude is that because that is not the case, a suffering has been spared and it is you who has spared her this suffering at the price that now you have to survive and mourn her. So by changing the attitude in how we see despair, we can uproot a meaning which gives a purpose to our existence. Carl Jung also noticed the collective neurosis that Frankl previously mentioned, saying the following, I quote, 
Man cannot stand a meaningless life. The least of things with a meaning is worth more in life than the greatest of things without it. It is only the things we don't understand that have any meaning. Man woke up in a world he did not understand, and that is why he tries to interpret it. About a third of my cases are suffering from no clinically defiable neurosis, but from the senselessness and emptiness of their lives. This can be defined as the general neurosis of our times." End quote. Another quote, he says, The only meaningful life is a life that strives for the individual realization, absolute and unconditional, of its own particular law. To the extent that a man is untrue to the law of his being, he has failed to realize his own life's meaning. End quote. Jung also identified that individual realization was at the heart of finding a meaning to life. He put great emphasis on the individuation process, but the method which allows one to become self-realized is approached through a method called circumambulation. This is the idea that through continuous potential as an individual, interests manifest themselves in present life. These interests are those which will help you realize what it is that will hopefully allow you to gravitate towards your ideal self. But the problem here is that obviously you will begin as the archetypal fool as that is always the case before becoming a master in whatever it is that you idolize. Therefore, there are continuous diversions which one will make, so it's never a linear psychological evolution. It's more circular, but by every inch you are slowly rotating inwards to attain the center of the self. It's no different from a maze, and maybe even the concept and creation of the maze is a conscious or unconscious representation of circumambulation, because one enters into the game of life from all different entrances, but then one is continuously confronted with physical and mental walls until reaching the center. Frankl's logotherapy is, I think, very much an antidote to existential problems because it is the only psychological therapy produced specifically for confronting the existential vacuum, nihilism, and the different ways in which the will to meaning can become submerged under the ever-present neurotic triad of aggression, addiction, and depression in the modern age. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like, subscribe and comment down to below to get involved in the discussion. Talking about discussion, you can find a link to the new Thoughts on Thinking Facebook group down below, so make sure to join if you want to get involved in conversations about philosophy, sociology, psychology and literature. Make sure to follow my social media such as Instagram and Twitter to keep up to date with everything that is going on, and also Patreon where you can donate a minimum of $2. Lastly, a quick shout out to my patrons. Thank you to Daniel Kazmi, The Truthism, Noah, Shahad, and John for supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching, and I will speak to you in the next video.